the Strand Chamber. Um, so we'll start uh, with the summons of the meeting. Uh, you're hereby summoned to attend the meeting of the Health and Community Committee, which will be a hybrid meeting conducted remotely via WebEx and physically in the Council Chamber uh, Straban offices on Thursday, the 13th of October, 22 at 4 p.m. Um, so we'll just continue with the attendance. Alderman Devaney. Here, Karen. Alderman Guy. Here, Karen. Alderman Kerrigan. Here, Karen. Councillor Michaela Boyle. Here, Karen. Councillor Doyle. Here. Councillor Edwards. Councillor Farrell. Here. Councillor Ferguson. Councillor Fleming. Okay, thank you. Councillor Fleming. Councillor Harkin. Councillor Jackson. And Shaw. Councillor McGinley. And Shaw, Karen. Councillor Barr. And Councillor Tierney. And can I just. Here, Karen, and great to be in Okay, thank you. Um, and can I just recheck then, Councillor Barr? Yeah, Karen. Thank you. Councillor Harkin. And Councillor Fleming. Okay, thank you, members. Thank you, Karen. Uh, members, going to read out the broadcasting uh, statement. I'd like to remind uh, everyone present at this meeting in the Day Road Chamber, um, our intends remotely that this meeting will be broadcast live to the internet and will be capable of repeated viewing. This broadcast may be terminated or suspended in accordance with our protocol. Due to your attendance at this meeting, you are consenting to being filmed and to use and storage of those images for broadcasting and training purposes and for the purposes of keeping historical records and making those records available to the public. Members and approved speakers remain to only have their mics and cameras on while speaking at the meeting and to use the chat facility to highlight any request to speak. A copy of Council's privacy notice may be found at jstraban.com. Okay, members, uh, item four is decorations of members' interests. If they want to declare any interests now, or they can do it um, as the meeting progresses. Okay, members, item five is a deputation, and we have representatives from the Home Office um, and Mayor's Housing. I don't think Mayor's Housing is here yet, but I uh, would like to welcome Tom and Michael uh, from the Home Office. And I believe you has, have a, a presentation if you want to go ahead and present to the committee. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael, and I'm from the Home Office and the um, assistant director um, for um, the asylum accommodation contract in, uh, in Northern Ireland. I should just explain who Tom and I are from the Home Office. So, um, uh, fun fundamentally, we are involved in the uh, operational delivery of the contract. Um, so, we have no role in policy. Um, and our, our responsibility is for the management of the asylum accommodation support contract um, so just move on to the next slide please right so uh, there are job titles um, i've put uh, the the most important contracts that we've got in there um, they're they're a matter of public record they're publicly available for anyone to see um, they are referred to as the statement of requirements uh, for the ask contract. They're all all the contracts are the same, are the same across the across the UK, um, but they're delivered by different providers. So Mears have the contract to deliver in Northern Ireland, as you uh, as you know, but they also have a separate contract to deliver in Scotland and a further contract to to deliver in the northeastern uh, of England and Yorkshire and Humberside. Um, there is another contract which works very closely to ours and that's delivered by Migrant Help. Um, that's a, 
what's referred to as the air contract um which uh, which is basically fundamentally a um uh, a, a contact service which is manned 24 7 um and that is the that is the uh, the way asylum seekers can um, raise issues uh, complaints and requests for assistance um, they are uh, that contract is managed through two sites one it in cardiff um in wales and the other one at um dover um and they are split in terms of the complexity of the different of the different um of the different contracts so i should say what air stands for which is advice issue reporting and in and eligibility so um that's those they are the main two uh two contracts and if we could move on to the next slide please uh in in summary and in, in very very brief summary because um there isn't much time to to cover on this Members, we seem to have lost Michael there. Um, we'll wait till he comes back on. Or, Tom, are you able to, to pick up, or would you prefer Michael comes back on? Tom, you're mute there, just to so let you know. Um, we just try to sort out mix audio here, uh, and his, uh, whether, uh, and his mic. Mm. Okay. Uh, Tom, are you able to con continue on with the presentation or, uh, give us two seconds. Right. No problem. Do you want to. Uh, Mick's going to continue on my uh, microphone here. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Hi, sorry about that. Um, okay, so um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was up to other Home Office supporting operations. Um, so we do have a safeguarding uh, operation uh, in Northern Ireland, as we do elsewhere across uh, GB. Um, and the safeguarding operation runs from a, from a safeguarding hub. We also have a compliance team who ensure that uh, asylum seekers who are in receipt of asylum support, both accommodation and uh, payments through Section 4, Section 95 or Section 98 or anything else, um, I comply with the terms in which that support is provided. Um, I should say there is a specific Northern Ireland context to how asylum operates. Um, uh, or in this area, um, in, and in short, that means that well, the people who uh, present and claim asylum in Northern Ireland remain in Northern Ireland uh, until such time as their claim is heard. And if they receive a grant, then they're free to go anywhere in uh, elsewhere in Northern Ireland or indeed Great Britain as they choose. Um, we do not disperse um asylum seekers to northern ireland some of you might be aware that there has been a a, a, a huge um influx of people by small boats across the english channel um, those people remain in england wales and scotland they are not dispersed to northern ireland so people stay here generally as a rule unless there are 
exceptional circumstances, be they personal to that asylum seeker or indeed operational. And, um, and in the teeth of what we are dealing with at the moment, that has been necessary to move some people predominantly to Scotland, but it has been, they have been moved to England as well. But they are exceptional circumstances and that's not something that we that is in our current um, operating strategy. Um, I should say something about our current pressures. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that the levels of asylum intake um, across Great Britain and Northern Ireland have been uh, extremely high, um, unprecedented in, in recent years, um, and that continues. Um, so what that means is we are uh, in a position that we don't want to be in, which is accommodating um, lots of people in hotels. Um, we accept fully um, hotels are not the correct place to uh, accommodate people, but unfortunately, um, there is a shortage of properties for people to move into um, easily. Uh, and as a consequence, people are having to stay in hotels for uh, longer than we, much longer than we would like before they moved into what we refer to as dispersed accommodation. So we are doing the best that we can within that ho within hotel accommodation uh, for the folks that are accommodated there. And that is the way that we fulfill our statutory obligation. So um, our priorities right now, and this is in Northern Ireland as well as everywhere else in, in, in GB, is to, uh, it, to increase the amount of properties that we can procure um, in every local authority area in Great Britain and Northern Ireland so far as we can um, to, um, to procure a, a suitable accommodation for people to live while their applications for asylum are being, um, are being progressed. Um, so that's kind of where we are at the moment. Um, and I guess, you know, this is a very short presentation. I accept that. Uh, but I understand that it'll be a number of questions that we'll certainly do our best to answer. Okay, thank you, Michael. I'm just going to double check to see if the, the, the mayor's representative is on the call, members. Could Colin user two into the, the meeting? Could they identify themselves, please? Just checking if Michelle is on the call, if she's in the meeting. Okay, members, it seems that the mayor's representative isn't um, on the call, so I'm going to open um, the deputation up to questions for, for the Home Office, if anyone wants to come in. Councillor Sinoy Bar. Chair for bringing me in and thank you Martin for your short presentation. Uh, I just have a question, and this is just, uh, I have two questions. First of all, am I right in saying that the Mia's group is um, holds the contract for accommodation, both hotels and residential homes? Michael, if you wanna come in there on that question. Sorry, I was talking away to myself, and uh, I just noticed I was on. I was on mute. So, yes, um, in answer, short answer to the question, uh, Mears are the uh, asylum accommodation support contract holder with the Home Office, and uh, Tom and I manage that that okay. contract. They have contracts for Northern Ireland, Scotland, the North East, Yorkshire, and Humberside. So, just a follow up question on that: Who are Max 
residential? I'm sorry, I don't, I can't answer that question. There may well be, and I'm guessing here, they may, they might be a subcontractor. So Mayors operate in a commercial environment, uh, and they do uh, they, come, they they enter agreements with um, uh, different property uh, holders and uh, landlords, etc., in order to uh, deliver against the uh, deliver against the contract. So they have a whole range of um, of landlords and different property. Uh, developers who they who they work with we don't tend to get involved with the subcontract though the standards that we expect have to comply with the with the statement of requirements which i've put in the presentation there thank you Martin. if i may ask uh, another follow-up question uh, this is really important because um, and by the way, let me declare an interest. I am the director of the Northwest Migrants Forum, and many members here would know that we, I work directly with asylum seekers who are in the city. And we have been dealing with a lot of issues, particularly on accommodation. But today I want to talk about the shortages of housing, which we do know that there is a shortages of homes in Northern Ireland. But I do not accept that there is a shortage of suitable accommodation that can provide a home feeling for people who are coming to seek safety here. This is because I have been contacted by um, several people who hold properties and who have been trying to secure a contract with a home office and also through mayors. And this is where the uh, question that I ask who are MAC residential come from. It, it appears that there are some subcontractors who are contracted to provide housing by the mayors group, which these subcontractors are there to make even more profit than what mayors is making and not taking suitable accommodation that is available to uh, provide asylum seekers good homes, good comfortable homes, because they want to pay the cheapest prices. I can provide evidence of that, and this is why it is critical that we address these issues today, if not today, a follow-up on um, accommodation that is being turned down and asylum seekers provided accommodation that is not suitable. Okay, so I can't comment on the um, the individual commercial relationships that um, Mia's ent enter into with um, with whoever, be that Mac residential or or whoso or whosoever. And, um, um, my sole interest is that all of the accommodation that Mia's procure, be that whether or not they buy the property outright themselves or the um, they enter into any lease arrangements with a, a private landlord or um, arms length management organization or whosoever um what we are interested in is the standards um within that accommodation much must comply with our contract and the contract that we have um they are at least the legal minimum standards so if you are claiming that any of the properties that are being currently used to accommodate asylum seekers are beneath those standards and that you have concerns about them, um, then I think what you should do is to raise those with us through the Migrant Help helpline as a third party. So you can get consent from the asylum seekers who are accommodated in that property and uh, and you can make plain your, your unhappiness on behalf of the asylum seeker in terms of why you think those uh, properties are beneath um, the um, the appropriate appropriate levels, and and as a result of that, they will be um, investigated. And if they are, and if you're found to be accurate, um, we will demand that Mia's put right any problems or any faults that are in that in that property, or that 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 that, that uh, Mia's make the decision themselves to cease using them. But um, so what we can't do is to get into the the weeds of a discussion around the commercial arrangements and about how much profit or otherwise um, providers or subcontractors are 
are making. It is a commercial arrangement. Um, so that is, you know, within the business model that is set up between Mears and their subcontractors, there is an inevitability that there will be a profit um, in within, within that, as there is for all uh, property development, property delivery within the within the private sector. Um, my concern is is what you um, uh, have alleged on this on this call that um, those properties are beneath the acceptable standards. I'm very interested to know which properties, and as soon as, and as soon as you can give us that information through the migrant help helpline, and you can do that as a third party. Uh, providing that there is consent from the um, the people who are accommodated there under the contract, then they will be investigated, and we will take we will take forward any concerns. That that could be a, a lengthy process, but not that lengthy. But if there are notable defects within the property per se, then the asylum seeker themselves can raise what we, we would refer to as a request for assistance. So for example, um, and I'm not saying this is the case, it's just an example. If there was a, a fault in the property, for example, if there was damp or uh, the um, the shower wasn't working or there was the heating was off, et cetera, then that can be raised through a, re a request for assistance. And we have timeframes that we work with, that we demand that Mia's respond to and and put right some of the faults that are that are there. Obviously, the more serious ones, which are um, to make a, a home fit for human habitation, that should be secure and that should be um, uh, safe and warm, etc. Then we would expect the um, the provider to to uh, react very very quickly, and we manage them in accordance with that um, with that part of their contract. So, in short. There is a route to raise all of these issues with us through Migrant Help um, and give us the details and we will respond to them. Could I say no, Barry, you happy enough? Or... Chair, can I come in again? Um, yep, go ahead. I, I want to follow up on the Migrant Help uh, because only yesterday I was contacted by five gentlemen who live in one address here in the city, and they have been contacting their mayor's representative, requesting some very essential items to be supplied, such as vacuum cleaner to clean the house. Mm -hmm. These gentlemen come from four different uh, religious backgrounds. They live in the same house. They have one fridge. Uh, some are Muslims and others are non-Muslims, and those who are Muslim are struggling because there is they don't eat pork, as we know, and some the non-Muslim would be eating pork, and the food is put in the same fridge. The second issue is because of hygiene purposes, particularly for the Muslim during prayer time, they need to make sure their environment is clean. They are also very clean when they are praying. They don't even have a vacuum cleaner. They have been asking for the last for weeks for to be supplied of these items. There are more items, I'm, I'm just picking one. And they were told that they should be sending uh, their request to migrants help. So if we can just get clarification, is migrants help to, uh, to support lodge complaints or to supply items? Because my understanding is for them to to launch complaints on behalf of asylum seekers. But that's, you... that's correct. So Migrant Help's role is not to supply those items. Um, it is Mia's role to supply those items. So uh, Migrant Help exists as a helpline um, for uh, a, a supported asylum seeker to raise a request for assistance. So in this case, they would be, uh, they would could they could contact um, migrant help and say we need a vacuum cleaner to keep our property um, clean, etc. And that and details of that request would be are immediately passed to Mia's who are expected to respond. So I can't go into I don't know the individual case, but that that is the that is the process. That is what should happen, um, and um, that is Mia's role 
to provide all of those uh, all of those items and that's what we would refer to as the inventory of items that should be in every property to help a, uh, to help asylum seekers uh, live in that property as, uh, as safely and securely and, and as comfortably as possible so migrant help do not have a direct role in providing those empty those items they have a role in um, rip, uh, for asylum seekers to raise um, complaints if there is a complaint and if they have if they've if they've previously requested those items and it and it sounds like they have and and for four weeks they haven't had a response to that then i would suggest that what they should do is raise a complaint um, and we encourage complaints um that is that is how we understand the activities of what's going on when in the delivery of the contract um so i couldn't encourage everyone on this call who comes in contact with asylum seekers who might be unhappy about the support that they are receiving to flag a complaint with migrant help and my colleagues within the home office will take that forward and investigate it uh, and um, and discuss and discuss the outcome of that with uh, with mayors um, and part of that outcome can be something uh, the award of a, a failure on their key performance indicators which means that uh, service credits would be charged against the provider, in this case, MIAS, and that means that they would lose money on the delivery of the contract. So um, we, we think that's the best way of managing the contract, that the MIAS are in business um, to, to make a profit, and we want to encourage them to raise standards, et cetera, and we do that through key performance indicators and the award of service credits. But we can't do that on if complaints are not being made and uh, and if we can't and requests for assistance aren't being made either so we encourage we encourage in short we encourage both and migrant help or an independent uh, body they're a registered charity who work for the home office under contract thank you um, chair um just a quick thing um i i believe that um um, uh, there are representatives from Miz on the call. They they were unable to unmute themselves earlier. I've just got a text from um, one of them. Are you? I'm so sorry for joining late. This is Michelle McGee, the initial accommodation head of operations. Can you hear me now? Yep, I hear you, Michelle. Give me two two minutes. Yep, members, we'll we'll go ahead with the mayor's presentation, and we'll come back to. Uh, members question then I think Jay, can I just before you do that can I just ask yeah, you can I just ask to say that I've answered that question correctly that people are happy with the answer yes yes we would agree thank you sorry guys it's just due to technical difficulty so my name is Michelle McGee I work for mayors I am the initial accommodation head of operations manager and I'm just going to give a quick presentation on who we are and what we do so Mayors began in August 2019 for a 10-year contract with the Home Office. We are an accommodation provider. We provide habitable, habitable accommodation with housing management, welfare support and repair and maintenance services within. Our contract places greater emphasis in the standards of properties. We provide a signposting service to organisations. We complete inductions with service users in their own languages to make sure that they fully understand everything that is involved once they come into the mayor's accommodation, uh, really to ascertain if they have any mobility issues, any dietary requirements, and have any vulnerabilities. All our mayor's staff, when recruited, must complete safeguarding level two. We also roll out essential training workshops and courses every few months to all hotel staff and security teams. All dispersal accommodation would usually be through private landlords. All properties are approved by the PSNI and the housing executive. Just reiterating what the Home Office have advised, our remit here today was to give an update on education, health, culture, welfare and safeguarding provisions. However, I must stress that we are not the healthcare professionals. We provide safe and habitable accommodation and we thank post to all relevant third sector organizations. Thank you.
Thank you, Michelle. Um, the next and speaker speakers, Councillor Jackson. Um, thank you, Chair, and thanks to Michelle and to Michael. Um, and on behalf of Champlain, I want to welcome you to the committee today. Um, and I know Councillor Sinoy Barr um, had touched on and asked some of the questions that I, I had intended they they ask, but I suppose the 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 answers that we received from Michael um, pose more questions um, than than they answered. Um, I think I'm going to start by the, the by starting off from the start. See, whenever mayors were awarded the contract, um, there was there was concern voiced in this chamber from within our own council around mayors' track record, um, around providing support to people that are that are coming to this part of the world um, seeking asylum. And there some of the some of the horror stories that we that we hear from Britain around um, people being uh, placed in cramped and unsafe accommodation. Um, there there seemed to be no regard from mayors around their basic human rights. And I, I want I came to this meeting today hoping to be reassured that that anybody coming um they any part of the north would be housed in suitable accommodation, that there would be checks and balances, they uh, ensure that there was nobody falling through the cracks, that there would be nobody um who would be placed in accommodation that isn't meeting their needs. From what we've heard from the Home Office is that the onus is on those that are seeking asylum. They they make a complaint, um, and 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 Michael's comments, and, and I'm I'm hoping that you can maybe expand on this a wee bit. Um, that this is the best way to manage some performance. Um, I, I I would ask a very simple question and say, have the Home Office not got the resources? They ensure that accommodation is suitable. Um, it's a massive contract. We've already heard concerns around um, that that this is that that it's driven by profit. Um, that the needs of individuals and families that are that are seeking um, asylum and, and within our own district. Um, there's there's concerns that their needs aren't being put for first and foremost. There's uh, there's an expectation that the home office home office would provide some level of oversight, um, and they put the entire onus on asylum seekers. Is uh, they may it's it's concerning. So I just wouldn't mind um, a wee bit a wee bit more information in relation to that. And and in, in terms of Michelle. Um, I fully accept everything that you've said and um, and support the organisation um, in terms of what these are doing because I think there does need to be a coordinated approach um, in terms of signposting people, providing support um, because we, we, there's there's all the complexities um, when when people are 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 leaving their homes are leaving their country of origin um, under very um, dangerous circumstances. Um, it's it's uh, very important that that every level of support that's available is made available to people, and, and that needs to be clear. Um, and it needs uh, it, it needs it needs to be coordinated uh, and and easy to access. Uh, and I appreciate that all the concern. Around mayors, um, originated from Britain. It, um, we're not picking up major issues here, but there is reputational. Uh, there was reputational damage around um, the the mayors, the the provision that mayors had provided, um, particularly in Glasgow. So um, we just wouldn't want to see that replicated here. And we, there was an expectation that that there would be additional checks and balances, and I'm not packing. I'm not. I'm not. I suppose I'm getting that reassurance at the committee today. 
So I just I would I would like a wee bit more clarity in relation to that, Chair. Thank you. So can I can I come back to that? Yep, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, sorry. So that's probably my fault for um, responding to the narrow question that I got, which is I'm not complaining about the question, by the way. It's a, a right one to the right one to raise. So the the way I framed that answer was uh, in response to a specific set of circumstances where um, where asylum seekers had um, a, a, a complaint, and the, you know that those things happen within any housing and social support uh, delivery system. So a couple a couple of things to uh, respond to. Firstly, uh, Mia's got this contract in uh, August 2019. Uh, prior to that, they didn't um, deliver any contracts for the Home Office. So I'm a bit baffled by um, the claim that they had a poor reputation prior to that because they didn't work for us uh, before, before, before then. Um, so they've worked for us for the Home Office from um, August 2019 up until the current time. Um, prior to that in Northern Ireland, uh, Circo delivered the contract, if I'm not mistaken, and Circo delivered the contract in Scotland. Um, the contracts were only in Glasgow and Belfast at that, at that particular time. Um, I would ask you to judge um, me as on what you see and not what you hear from sometimes um, exaggerated uh, claims. I'm not saying me as a perfect, who is, um, mistakes will happen, it, there are areas for improvement, etc. So judge them on what you see and what you hear. Um, the second point I think is that um, I, I don't think it's fair to say that we leave it to asylum seekers to uh, make sure that the the accommodation that they're in is fit and proper. Mayors will have uh, housing managers and a whole housing apparatus which checks that every accommodation at least once per month um, there is an inspection of the property and any issues within that accommodation is um, is picked up at, at that point if it's a cosmetic issue etc if it's an emergency issue for example if the utilities were to go off or um, there was a um, an accident or a, um, a, a more serious issue then that would be dealt with more quickly um, so I would say to you um, that um, we do not do that. We do we do not leave it to asylum seekers to make sure their properties are okay. Mayors have a responsibility to inspect those those properties. We also have uh, an assurance team who are a visiting team, and on on the basis of a number of different algorithms uh, directing their work, they will go and visit properties across uh, Northern Ireland. So they'll. As you might expect, a lot of their work will be in Belfast because that's where the majority of the accommodation currently is, as well as hotels, etc. So that team will go out, sometimes unannounced, and they will inspect property and they will provide their feedback to mayors. And uh, sometimes that's critical, and other times it's it's otherwise. So um, I, I think I probably um, created the wrong impression with my answer to the earlier question. Um, we do not leave it to asylum seekers to. Uh, make sure their accommodation is okay, but they have a role in uh, providing us with updates as to what may be going wrong within a property and to make those requests for assistance. Mayors themselves are visiting the properties at least once per month, and they, um, uh, and we have an assurance team which, on the basis of any intelligence that we receive, will go out and inspect the properties themselves and, and have that feedback loop with um, with Mears and indeed the other accommodation providers across GB and the rest and Northern Ireland, of course. So I hope that gives you that assurance. Councillor Jackson, happy enough for wanna come back in. No, um, thanks for that that clarity, um, Michael. And um, and I suppose just packing up in terms of your point around maybe the confusion or why why where where the concerns came from the concerns came from when we as a council um made a very firm commitment and declaration that the asylum seekers are welcome uh, in this part of the world and within our council area and that we as a council would be re there ready to support anybody who is who's coming to these shores to seek asylum um and 
during during that time it was it was highlighted and and it, and it was post um twenty nineteen, um so there it was made made clear that that it was mayors that had the contract, and that's when the the human rights concerns um that uh, that had arisen from the contracts that mayors had in Glasgow, um that they they had, that it was at that stage that. That those concerns had been raised, um, I'm reassured that there is unannounced checks that are taking place. That there's that ongoing engagement, um, and uh, apologies for the confusion. It just from your initial um, quite answer, it just that wasn't very clear, and it, it seemed that the onus was on um, asylum seekers. So I'm glad that those those checks and balances are. are uh, are taking place and that I would hope that all accommodation and all support um, provided the asylum seekers is done in a, 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 with a human rights focus. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for that. And my, ap my apologies because I gave a very narrow answer. I, ca I can't say that in Glasgow because, you know, I've managed the contract since, the, since, the out, since August 2019. We do have very, very good relationships with Glasgow City Council. Um, asylum is a very controversial subject. A lot of people have a lot of opinions on how it should be managed. We deliver the asylum accommodation contract or other mayors do and we manage it to the best of our ability. And, uh, and we always want to get it right. We always want to improve what we're doing. And, and I say opportunities such as this for good constructive feedback to feedback into what we're doing so that we can hear what you're what you're saying and be cognizant of of all of the um the issues that you that you are that you are hearing yourself so that we can um with that we can refine what we're what we're doing you're part of how we can how we can um improve um our services and i have to say i've been really really gratified by the response to um the crisis that we find ourselves in trying to procure accommodation for asylum seekers in in Northern Ireland, when we know the property market is under severe strain, and mayors are are working within that, the same as as other um, housing uh, groups, be they in the public or private sector. So, firstly, um, thank you for the welcome today, and that's typical of this part of the world where there is such a readiness to to help uh, people who have come to uh, Northern Ireland. Thank you, Michael. The next speaker is Councillor Sean Harkin. Thank you, Chair. Uh, look, the first thing I'll say is uh, we have the, the British Home Office and Mayors on here today and they couldn't provide us with a, uh, a a report so we could prepare for this meeting in advance. And we have all sorts of organisations and individuals that come in here to do uh, deputations and the vast majority of them who are much less resourced than your organisations uh, provided uh, written reports. And I just think that there's a lack of respect there, first of all, for this council and for this meeting. Um, the second thing I want to say is um, that, uh, you know, the, the issue here is that we have a government, a British government that is riddled with racism and, uh, and a company in charge uh, of uh, the government's policy in respect to asylum seekers that is only interested in making money. And... Um, I, I am very concerned about the, about the uh, direction of travel of the new uh, uh, Home Secretary, um, Suella Braverman, and her comments at the Tory conference about dreaming about filling planes full of asylum seekers and sending them to Rwanda. I mean, this is sickening stuff. Um, and, I, and I think it fundamentally goes against uh, the way our council district views asylum seekers as, people, as human beings who are fleeing war and poverty and climate chaos. Um, so there, there, there is a fundamental problem here uh, with uh, uh, that I do not have confidence in the Home Office nor in mayors to treat people uh, with respect and dignity um, uh, because the, the government right now is actually ramping up racism against the asylum seekers, and that's very clear based on the, um, the uh, Home Secretary's comments. And uh, look, you know, the, the, I, I find the defensiveness of both the Home Office and Mayors here revealing in terms of, you know, a lot has already happened in this district. 
where people have had to uh, fight with the Home Office and fight with mayors to make sure that asylum seekers who are in Derry are treated with a bit of dignity. And that that's what people have had to do. And I, I want to commend my uh, fellow uh, councillor, Lillian Sinoy Barr, who's on the call, because she in many ways has uh, led this, uh, along with other councillors and other campaigners. But it hasn't been a straightforward process where uh, you know, people have been treated with respect. They haven't. They haven't been treated with respect at all. And it's the Home Office that is setting the policy that that uh, that that Mears is then handed to carry out. Um, so, you know, I I think that a strong message needs to come from uh, Derry and, and Stravan District Council today about the whole way in which uh, the Home Office and Mears. Uh, treat are treating asylum seekers uh, because the only way accountability is, has been achieved here is through uh, people actually stand, working with asylum seekers who are here. Uh, the council putting the whole an alternative set of arrangements from the ones that the Home Office have um, been promoting uh, uh, and, and uh, trying to fight to make sure Mears treats people um, not as uh, things that they're going to, uh, asylum seekers, not as something that they're just going to make money out of and cut every corner possible, but actually treat people with dignity. Now, there is an issue here with migrant help. Um, uh, you know, there's a lot of complaints about the way migrant help function, that uh, it, it doesn't properly represent um, uh, the, the concerns of asylum seekers. And I've heard that from asylum seekers, and I've also heard it from, uh, uh, you know, people who are campaigners and other people and other and others who asylum seekers have spoken to. So the the I, I think that what we're hearing from the Home Office is if there's any issues, go to migrant help. We don't want to be directly uh di take direct uh responsibility. So I, I think that there's a built-in problem here and it once again speaks to the reluctance and unwillingness of the Home Office to deal directly uh with this um with these issues. They're 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 not just trying to outsource uh, asylum seekers, they have for-profit corporation that is only interested in making money. They're also trying to, they've also managed to figure out a way now to outsource problems to an organization that people uh, don't have full confidence in. So um, I, I, I think that this whole experience uh, that, that we have gone through as a council has been very, very, uh, you know, frustrating. And I think that that has to be properly, uh, I think that that message has to be sent clearly to the Home Office representatives and to the Mayor's uh, representatives here today. Thank you, Chair. Can I reply? Thank you, Councillor Um Michael, yep, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm really, really sorry that you think that there is a lack of respect from the Home Office. I can assure you that absolutely is not the case. Um, Tom and I actually wanted to come to Derry and Straban today to meet with you, but uh, I'm, I'm currently sitting in a in an office in Belfast having this, having this call. So uh, there is absolutely no lack of respect uh, so far as uh, myself and Tom are concerned, who are your immediate contacts within the Home Office in this part of the um, part of the operation. So if you feel that, I'm really sorry that you feel that way. Um, I'm disappointed that you feel that way, but um, certainly that that is not what we uh, intend. We are operational staff. I'm not going to comment on the, the development of policy and politics. That's not my role. I'm here to make sure that the accommodation um, contracts that are delivered are delivered in the best possible way so that the people who are in our care have the best possible outcomes. Um, in terms of the written update, um, I can give you some background in terms of how things work or should work generally. Within, Nor within Northern Ireland, there isn't currently what is referred to as a strategic migration partnership. We are working very closely, uh, colleagues of mine are working very closely with the executive office to remedy that. But at the moment, there is a vacuum in, uh, in Northern Ireland, which needs to be filled. And we are working very close, uh, closely with uh, the executive office that we can overcome some of the difficulties that we have in this part of the world, which we don't have in Scotland, the North East Yorkshire and, else and elsewhere in GB. Um, so we are trying to overcome those issues. When we overcome those issues, what we'll be able to do is to provide a monthly data pack to all of the um, uh, to the SNP in Northern Ireland, or we are looking at 
alternatives to how we achieve that, that will provide you with a mountain of data as to what's happening in this space. Um, we'll try and provide you with as much narrative around that as possible uh, where we can. Um, we have provided a, a, a presentation today. I have to say this subject area is so massive I could provide a 100 page written report and it wouldn't hit the button with you good people because it's so it's such a, a vast area. If you want anything from us, please just ask Tom is the service delivery manager in Northern Ireland and we will try and respond as quick as we can. I have to say we have a narrow focus in this area and that is to try and maintain the best possible standards of accommodation and support for folks in, in this part of the world. Uh, I think Michelle mentioned earlier the limitations of what we do. So we aren't responsible for the delivery of health services, education um, uh, and anything else. They are delivered through those statutory bodies in Northern Ireland. And likewise, we work with the voluntary and community sector to leave it, leave her in additional support and with the local authorities, etc. for any uh, additional support that can be provided. What we deliver is within that contract. Now, you are entitled to an opinion about that being provided by a private company, and I accept that. Some people think it's a great idea and others less so. Um, as, I've, as I've mentioned, I think the contract works well most of the time. Perhaps you might think, uh, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Um, but we are I'm not blind to the fact that there will be mistakes. There will be areas that we need to address. We need your support in how we do that. Um, any intelligence that you've got about where we might be falling short in specific cases, we will be all ears and we will, all, we, will, we will respond to that as best we can. But I'll return to the original point. I'm really, really sorry that you think that there was a lack of respect from the Home Office to Derry and Sturban. Uh, speaking very personally and in a heartfelt way, I really, really hope we can work on that and resolve that. That is definitely not how we are approaching this how we are approaching this work. Thank you, Michael. Uh, next syndicate speaker is Alderman Devaney. Thank you, Chair, for uh, allowing me in. Uh, and just on behalf of the DUP, just can I welcome Michelle uh, and Michael uh, and welcome the, the, the presentation. I think very, very clearly coming from the thrust of the meeting here today, uh, it's all about um, a good standard of accommodation, um, quality standard of accommodation, uh, and I appreciate um, what Michael has said, and he does put his hands up and says, sometimes there are mistakes. And uh, I see that, um, whether that should be through even, even private rental or even housing executive properties, um, not only just for migrants um, or people coming to visit, but even people who live here locally looking for houses, there are always ongoing issues when they move into a house. But I think, uh, Michael, you have clearly um, spelled out um, how do you manage these problems uh, if they're an issue when someone moves into a property? And I also take on board that, that look, um, checks are taken um, every month. And surely if there were any issues and around um, the accommodation that a migrant may be in, surely those um, issues could be raised then or on the monthly checks. And I do take on board that, that you do say, yes, contact yourselves uh, if there is a problem. Uh, and look, I do appreciate it was um, Councillor Sinoe Barr who brought this um, all to a head. And uh, look, I do believe, look, uh, at the end of the day, there are problems, but there are problems that, that, that need to be resolved. Uh, and as you said earlier on, there are mistakes uh, and you need to know what the problems are before you can fix them. But just on behalf of the DEP, I would just like to thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Chair, this is Michelle. Michelle, go ahead. I would just, I would just like to, you know, I'm listening to everything myself and my colleagues here from mayors, and we would love the opportunity, you know, to take you around, especially one of the big hotels we have here in Derry, London Derry, and we've also branched out into some of the family homes. I, I have welfare officers in the hotels. There from nine to half five every day, supporting every single service you're living there. Um, you know, helping them with their welfare needs, their vulnerabilities, trying to re help them with their GP registration forms. And even whenever I'm up in there, the atmosphere within the hotel is lovely. You know, they always continually say to me, you know, we, we really feel well supported. I would welcome the opportunity to bring anybody 
anybody at all around with me. Um, you know, I work in the initial accommodation, which would be the hotel side of it, and I've also got Ryan McMahon here. He would be the head of operations for the dispersal accommodation. And we both honestly would welcome the opportunity to bring you around some of the accommodations, meet the service users, and show you exactly what we do in the services we provide. And, you know, I have to say, we work to a very, very high standard. And the, the needs of the service users are our call front high priority every day that we work in Mears. Michelle, thank you very, very much. Um, and I think, as, as Chair of the Committee, I, I would like to take you up on the offer and uh, the Committee Clerk will take that as an action. Hopefully that can be arranged, Michelle. I do thank you for that. Um, Councillor Sina Boy, I'm, I'm going to allow you in as the last speaker here. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to make two comments, particularly on the issue of accommodation in the hotel. Yes, the hotel has improved, but we have dealt with those issues uh, since the, uh, the, the asylum seekers arrived here, issues of food, issues of time, um, when they are getting the food, uh, of hygiene, and that has improved. I can acknowledge that, but it has improved because the concerns were raised. But there are we visited some of us, uh, and I know Councillor Sean Harkin, um, there was somebody else who visited some of the accommodations that Mia's had taken us around here in the city. We were shown two very good houses. That is not the case for some of the other accommodations that are available. I'll, I'll speak about a specific house here just because we are speaking about accommodation and Mias is here and I'm glad that they were able to attend the meeting. There's a, a, a certain house which I've mentioned that does not have all the uh, essential items that are required for living in a healthy, clean environment. It's still the same as now and they have raised concern for the last four weeks and in every accommodation that has been provided, there has been issues. And if we are to provide a place for people who are coming to seek safety, people who are going through a lot of mental health issues, and they have to spend four weeks asking for essential stuff, like even a cooker that can cook, which is taking almost three weeks, that shouldn't happen. The house should be ready when they are getting in, not them discovering that it has a problem and then contact migrant help uh, who sometimes don't answer questions, don't answer phone calls. And we have evidence of that. We have emails that have been sent through to migrant help. This is why I needed clarification in terms of what is actually their role, because if we're calling them migrant help. For some asylum seekers, they have used statements like they are migrants nightmare instead of migrants' help, because they don't answer urgent questions that are required to be able to um, settle in an environment. Some people have children, and they're not able to even uh, provide and um, the help that they need. So this is not something that has just happened in Scotland. It is happening within our own city, and it may look very small for people around here, but for those asylum seekers, it isn't because it is, they expect that they will have essential items that they need. They expect that there will be respect for their cultural and religious beliefs. It is not the case at the moment, and there's a live case, and I'm more than happy to provide all the details if it is required in terms of the house, the house, the specific house. And Michelle, if you're working with the people with her hotel who are living in the hotel right now, what about those who you have provided home accommodation, who are they working with? Who is their contact person who is addressing their problems? Because they are not, that is why they are coming to our community center to seek additional help, including a microwave to heat food, a toaster for bread. These are essential items that should be in the house when they are moving in, with them asking for it. So yes, some things have improved and some haven't, and we shouldn't be having these discussions every single time we should make sure that they are already the house is ready for somebody to move in not them going to discover that they don't have essential issue items that they want and spend four weeks looking for them 
Thank you. Can you see me by uh, Michael, Michelle, do you just want to come back in there? Uh, yes, my, my, the last thing the last thing I'll say on the subject is is that there is an inventory of items that should be in accommodation before people move in. Um, the house should be clean and um, <coughs> excuse me and, uh, and and fit for human habitation. It should have had a it should have had a, a complete work over before anyone moves in. So it's disappointing to hear that that might not have happened. In those cases where it doesn't happen, and I have to say, I don't think this is systemic across <clears throat> the Mayor's estate. Uh, I would refute that. I would think that because we have our own customer insight data, which suggests that most of the time, most of the people are fairly happy with the support that they get. And what I would fervently encourage you to do is to take up Michelle's good offer to, to, to see some of that accommodation. We want to be completely transparent so that you can see what we are delivering. We work in, a, in, a, in an area which is of great public scrutiny uh, and we, uh, we're happy with that. But I would encourage you to take up um, Michelle's offer. On the flip side, where you think as an asylum seeker is not getting the support that they are entitled to through the contract, then you should raise that with Migrant Help either as a request for assistance or a complaint. Now, <clears throat> you've said some negative things about migrant help. The, con the air contract was established in response to consultation with the voluntary and community sector for some years prior to it established in 2019. And I would say it's a pretty good model, um, a standalone model which um, uh, for support for accommodation, which I don't think is replicated in a lot of other support for people who are in different types of accommodation. So, for example, in my own home city of Newcastle, the property is delivered through an arm's length management organisation. The complaints go to that same organisation and they regulate themselves. So within our world, we have a far greater level of scrutiny and assurance in how we manage that accommodation. And that reflects the specific vulnerabilities and needs of asylum seekers. So what I would say to you is, I think we deliver a decent service most of the time. Can we improve? Absolutely we can. And we need everyone's help to help us to do that and spot where we might be dropping the ball here and there. Um, and we will, we will work to ensure that we can improve. Uh, on the final point, I was stung by that criticism of not um, showing Derry and Straban enough respect. Um, we will do our utmost to make sure that we can turn that perception around because I think it's mistaken. Um, and uh, I've made a note to Tom here about some actions that we can that we can implement as a as a result. But um, we want to be touch tight with the delivery in Derry and Straban, and we need you to help us to achieve that. So I will belt up now you'll be relieved to hear and i'll hand over to michelle and michelle can have the last word hi guys thank you mick and i must say everything you've touched on there is exactly right and um, there is a food inventory list that when the landlords give us properties or we take on the properties we have an acquisition team that go out with the landlords to let them know exactly what is entailed in every single room in the house um, then it goes off maybe to the void team uh, with the repair and maintenance side of things. They would do their compliance checks, their gas checks, electricity checks. And then the last check is before the housing manager would move a family into the property. They do what's called the property readiness form. They go from room to room and make sure that everything in the property is ready for them. If it's not, they would contact the repair and maintenance team or the acquisitions manager and they would make sure it's there again. If there's things that have maybe been left out, normally during office hours, it would be their housing manager that they would contact. They have all their numbers. But if it is an out of hours, it would be um, the ER migrant health number they would communicate this to. And it would be then filtered through the mayors. And as long as we know about it, there's a contractual time frame that we have to supply these, these items. But again, how the managers once a month go out to see the family, conduct their inspection, and anything that's noted there, it's also noted. So, and again, if we're ever missing anything, please, please reach out and contact us directly. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, uh, Michelle. Members, I have no further indicated um, 
speakers. So in that regard, I'm going to bring the deputation to an end. And I just want to thank uh, Michael, Tom and Michelle for presenting uh, to committee t uh, t this evening. Um, and I would also look forward to um, a visit, Michelle, if we can get that um, organised with the committee. I think that would be um, be a good thing for us, for us to go on. And also um, welcome the fact that, that we're going to keep lanes of communications open around um, if there's any concerns, we can raise them directly with you. So I do appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to bring the deputation to an end now, members. Okay, members, I'm going to move on to item six on the agenda, chairperson's business. Um, members, I have no items to raise myself and no member has contacted me um, in the last few days to raise anything. So I'm going to move on to item seven, which is matters arising from the Open Minutes of Health and Community Committee held on Thursday, the 15th of September. It's pages one to 42 in your pack. If anyone wants to raise any issues. Okay, there's no members indicating. Um, members, moving on to item eight, which is update on measures taken to address poor air quality in areas surrounding Brook Park and Bull Park, pages 43 to 214. And Seamus is going to take this item. Uh, thanks, Chair. And members, this report is to update you on measures taken to address poor air quality in areas surrounding Brook Park and Bull Park. Members, you'll be aware that air quality within the council area meets air quality objectives except for four out of the five air quality management areas which are outlined in the report and they exceed nitrogen dioxide levels as a result result of road traffic emissions the council's air quality action plan aims to reduce levels of these pollutants and we await the publication of the revised clean air strategy for northern ireland the members council has passed a motion relating to actions the council can take to address poor air quality in the areas around brook park and bull park and you'll see from the report, it outlines the monitoring that's currently carried out. It includes five continuous monitoring stations and 24 sites where nitrogen dioxide is monitored. In order to reduce the pollutants associated with road traffic, there's basically two main solutions. The first one is to reduce the number of vehicles on the road. And the second is to increase uh, electric vehicles and understand they're to be compulsory from 2030. Council can increase air quality monitoring in the Bull Park area by relocating equipment uh, currently located in Newton Stewart, where the levels of pollutants are regarded as being low, and this would cost uh, approximately two and a half thousand pounds. And the recommendation, members, is to give consideration to relocate this piece of equipment from Newton Stewart to Bull Park. Okay. Councillor O'Neill. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not on this committee, um, but I just wanted to come in on, on this point. Um, as a number of residents have uh, you know, been in touch with me around uh, the power air quality, particularly around Bull Park and around Fregan Hill. Um, and you know, I think you know, we really shouldn't take uh, air pollution lightly at all. Um, you know, given that it's it's a major public health emergency, um, and leading to countless deaths. Um, I think eight hundred deaths a year is what the British Heart Foundation warned, uh, that air quality per air quality contributes to. Um, and I know, um, uh, Officer Shimas there said, uh, about the levels of uh nitrous oxide. I think it was. Uh, but you know, obviously, um, we're looking at. Uh, measuring PM two point five and PM ten, um, also which uh you know are also like significant tr contributors to to poor health, um, and the we're obviously waiting for the clean air strategy coming from Stormont and that has been delayed, um, but like a lot of the reports and research and findings, uh, you know, through that process is that we're not monitoring enough at all um you know particularly we're not you know monitoring pm 2.5 enough or ammonia levels um enough 
and all those you know can have uh, negative health consequences. So I would I would welcome um uh, you know this monitor to uh, being moved to Bull Park. Uh, but you know I suppose as uh, I've raised on on previous occasions on this issue, um, Shimas had said there about uh, you know reducing the number of cars and increasing the number of electric vehicles as as part of the solution. But there's also the green infrastructure solutions that I know our council uh support. Um, but I suppose I would like to know in a wee bit more detail, <clears throat> um, kind of around the Bill Park or the Craig and Hall area or Dale's Corner, which you know, in, in the Waterside, which is another hotspot hotspot for um some of the worst air quality levels um and, and on these islands. Um, you know, what green infrastructure measures uh you know can be taken whilst because we're we're not gonna that's gonna be a quicker uh measure to take than it is to like transform uh how we transport across our city. Um and you know in, in terms of like Bill Park, I like, you know, that area and in Dale's Corner, if we think about the the people who are most impacted by air quality, it's children and, and babies who are at the level of the car exhausts. Um, and, you know, it's children and, and, and young people who are accessing parks, who are accessing schools, you know, and there's a lot of uh, pedestrian traffic of, uh, of that population, you know, in the areas where air quality is worst uh, in our council district. So, um, and, you know, in Bull Park, there is opportunity there, like particularly for people who are utilizing the park, uh, for uh, green infrastructure solutions, I think Craig and Hall might be more challenging. I think Dale's Corner might be more challenging. But you know, has have officer, officers you know detailed out the green infrastructure measures uh, that can be taken, or is it something that we're that is still being talked about and and being uh, ideas being brought to the table? Um, are we like are we at the stage where we can? You know, put into place practical green infrastructure solutions uh, to as one of the measures to combat per air quality in these areas. Thank you. Through you, Chair, and thanks for the question, uh, Councillor O'Neill. By all means, uh, council officers will review the air quality management plan and liaise with the, the relevant statutory agencies and other council departments in relation to the green infrastructure and what measures potentially could be taken. Again, the key for nitrogen dioxide is uh, road traffic and DFA roads is a key stakeholder in relation to the infrastructure and ultimately trying to change behaviours as well. So we'll revert back at a later date in relation to what the, the options are. Councillor Neil, are you happy with the officer's response? Um, I suppose, like, I'm aware this is, like, almost the solution is across departments for council um you know there's like overlap there with environment and regeneration i suppose um you know will will a report come back to one of the relevant committees on the green infrastructure actions uh that might be you know that can be proposed to address air quality is is my key question really through you chair by all means in relation to the green infrastructure that's potentially uh consideration to be given in relation to this particular area. And I would imagine, similar to the Greenways, that uh, a report will be brought back to the ENR committee. But we'll liaise with council colleagues and decide where the this best sits. Okay, happy that, Councillor O'Neill? Yes, thanks, and thanks for letting me come in. No, no problem at all. Next, in the case speakers, Councillor Tierney. Chair, thank you, um, and thanks to Seamus um, for, for the report. Um, I want to make a slight amendment to the report and suggest that we call Bull Park by its actual name, um, the John O. Clufford Bull Park, um, is what it should be referred to, um, and I would like to see that updated in the, in the report. Um, in relation to the, the, the wider issue, um, as someone who grew up um, in this particular area, um, it has always been an area where um, traffic congestion has been an issue. Um, now, what the report tells us um, is that it's going to cost £2,500 to remove the existing infrastructure from Newton Stewart to up um, to the John O. Clufford, Clufford Park. Um, but it doesn't tell us how we're going to we're going to monitor it, but what are we going to do to try and change it, I think, is, is where we need to, to get to. Um, I think there's a potential to increase... Um, public transport in and around that particular area um, and uh, trying to encourage people out of their cars 
Um, it's actually phenomenal the amount of people that live in that area who would drive to the city centre. Uh, believe it or believe it not. Um, but the traffic congestion in and around that particular area, um, for as long as I can remember, has always, always been an issue. And it's going to take um, a societal change to try and uh, address this. But to get that change, we have to encourage it. Um, and we have to have plans and incentives um, in a way uh, that we can do that. Um, the paper doesn't tell us how we're going to do that. Um, and I would like to see some detail um, around how we do that. Maeve has made the, the, the point around, you know, it's a, it, it's a large, built up um, residential area. Um, and there are a number of, well, first and foremost, there, there are two major parks in that particular area. There are a number of schools in that area and, and youth clubs. And there's a lot of um, young people who are in and around that particular area. So whilst traffic congestion and anyone who is in, in the not too distant past try to drive up Craigan Street and over Laburnum Terrace, um, Marlborough Street, Laburnum Terrace, um, and back down Western Street, we'll see just how much congestion there is in that um, part of the city at any time of the day. Um, so that's a major, major issue. But what are we going to do? Yep, monitored, absolutely, we should be. But it's what we're going to do after that to try and change that habit um, and that, I suppose, gathering um, of, of, of vehicles in that particular area. That's where, where I would be keen to, to find out. I would also, um, because this is by no means my level of expertise, I would also be keen to understand in terms of the poor air quality within that particular area, um, what impact... Um, and what that will have for local residents and what it is we're planning to do to address that as well um, will be some of the, the, the key um, issues that I have around that. I have no issue in proposing the, the recommendation with the, the slight amendment that I know I might be being pedantic around that, but I think it's important um, that, that we do um, do that. Um, in terms of the, the relocation of the equipment, I have no issue in doing that, but I would like to see um, a plan for what we do once we do that to try and address the, the, the ongoing issue because it's okay to monitor it, but it's what we do whenever we've it monitored um, and how we address it then. Thank you. Through you, Chair, thanks for the question, Councillor Tierney. By all means, monitoring the, the first step and that'll help determine what uh, levels are in place and it'll help also in relation to the discussions with DFI Roads who are the key statutory agency that can help council and local residents in terms of road layout, uh, in terms of public transport, and all those measures that will help reduce and improve air quality in the area. So we'll take on board those uh, queries and bring back a further report. Happy enough, Councillor Tierney? H happy enough. Um, I'm slightly puzzled. When you talk about road layout um, and knowing the area, um, quite well. I'm slightly puzzled in terms of how and what other way you would you would lay the road out. Um, but I'm happy to see that that coming back. Um, but I'm just I don't know how that would feed in. You know, there's a, a discussion um, next week around the bogside parking scheme, which is obviously an issue, which believe it or not feeds into this particular area that we're talking about. Um, as far up as Little Diamond and Craigan Street. Um, Laburn and Terrace have all got the similar issues around park. So I, I would be keen to see in terms of the, the road layout what way um, that would um, look, but I'm happy to see that at, at a further date. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. James, do you want back in here? Just briefly, Chair, I suppose it's, it's not just road layout. Uh, traffic flows probably as important as, as the layout, and but all those will be taken on into consideration. Thank you, James. And Brian, we'll get the Park name updated as well. Yeah. Mr. Boyle, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just briefly, um, just in, in regards to the Spring Hill Park Air, Air Monitoring Station, uh, I know um, the community centre up there um, is in the process of um, hopefully, potentially, shortly getting their new uh, prefab. Um, and I just wondered. Will the air monitoring station that's situated there impact in any way in regards to the site or is, will it still remain there? Thanks. Yeah, uh, 
Councillor Boyle, we, we will take that in consideration. Obviously, the set criteria in terms of where the monitoring equipment is located and if there's any changes to those facilities and whether it's going to have an impact on the, the monitoring station, we'll take that on board. It may involve relocating it to a different location at a later date, but we'll keep members informed. Thank you, Seamus. Um, next speaker, Councillor Harkin. Apologies, Councillor Harkin. I, th I think I missed you first time. Go ahead. Uh, that's Grant Chair. No problem at all. Look, um, uh, I thank you, Seamus, for the report. And um, <clears throat> I think the I, I we have no problem, obviously, with the recommendations and with uh, Councillor Tierney's additional uh, rec uh, amendment to that. I, I think we are focused on solutions here. So I th to try and move that forward, what, what, what I want to propose is that we have a meeting with um, TransLink and DFA to talk about what, this, what solutions are to these areas uh, in an immediate sense, whether that is public transport or infrastructure, exactly what we've been emphasising. Um, I think we need to do that directly with them. Um, and I also think that the Council we should have a report on green infrastructure measures that we can put in place in a more immediate sense to try and manage some of the, um, the uh, you know, uh, per air per air quality in the areas that we that, that have been highlighted. So I want to propose that if uh, and I'll put that into the chat right now. If that's all right, Chair. Yep. Thank you, um, Councillor Harkin. Yep. Oh. Okay, Councillor, I'm just going to take the paper first and recommendation um, to move the monitoring from Newton Stewart to the is John O'Clifford Park. I'm going to take that first. I, don't, I didn't detect any disagreement on that, but I have Councillor Tierney proposing and I need a second there. I'll second, second that, Chair. Okay. Is that Councillor McGinley? Yep. Okay, and members that didn't detect any disagreement on that. So, in terms of that recommendation, the people are going to take it as passed. Okay, members going to move on to the proposal um, before us. I'm going to give members just a few seconds to, to have a look at it. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Harkin, you have proposed it. Do we have a seconder? I'll second it, Doyle. Oh, sorry. Okay, Councillor Doyle. Any members want to come in on the proposal? Councillor Tierney? Thank you, Chair. Just very briefly to say that we have no issue um, with it. Um, if it's something that will lead um, to a better outcome for uh, the entire district, then great, we've no issue with whatsoever. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Councillor Jackson? Thanks, Chair, in a, in a similar vein. Um, we were fully supportive of the motion. Um, as, as again, we've heard from, from TransLink and from DFA around their commitment, the um, reducing um, emissions from, from, uh, from vehicles. So. Um, if there's anything that we can do to try and advance that, um, we're, 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 this is an important first step, so we're happy to support it. Thank you. Councillor Jackson, any further indicated speakers? Alderman Guy. Thank you, Chair. No, Chair Harvey, I'd love to support uh, this proposal. Um, 
I know it's an issue that, that's been long looked at, especially in the areas of Craig and Howell and Deals Corner. Until we go much greener uh, with electric vehicles and so on, I can't see there being much change. Um, you know yourself, you're either Opera Hall or Downer Hall in our city. So uh, basically the, these are um, central locations where traffic just seems to be at a maximum. Um, and that's what we're up against. But thanks anyway, happy to support. Thank you, Alderman Guy. Members, I don't see any further speakers um members that i'm not sensing any um anyone go against this either so i'm going to take this motion as unanimous and pass it okay members i'm going to move on to item nine which is the local air quality management offer of grant from department of agriculture environment and rural affairs and Seamus is going to take this item Thanks, Chair. And uh, we remain on the same theme uh, in relation to our quality. And members are asked to note the report which outlines the level of funding councils obtained from DERA under the Environment Fund and the letter of offer, which outlines the breakdown of items funded and the funding rate, and which equates to just over 50% of the overall costs. And members, I would ask you to uh, refer to the, the previous report and the, the document attached. And there's a table within it, just in relation to working with other uh, lead agencies, which outlines uh, the measures incorporated into their quality management plan and all the lead uh, authorities and the, the measures that each authority is uh, focusing on. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Shim. Any member on the command? Councillor Fard? I'm happy to propose the item, but I've got one question, Seamus. I see that our overall spend for this year is £58,000, and there's a £31,000 grant from DERA. Last year, our total spend was 112000 and the grant was eighty four. So the reduction this year, is that due to a reduced budget or a reduced need for capital investment in air quality monitoring? Through you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Farrell. It relates to the reduced uh, necessity to install new monitoring equipment. Uh, so all the equipment has been refurbished, new equipment installed, and that's the, the reason why there's a reduction in funding required. Thank you, Seamus. Members, no further than... I'm happy to second that. Second up, Alderman Devaney. No further speakers. No one going against going to take that item as past members. Members going to move on to item 10, which is the Food and Essential Items Transition Fund proposals for the spare and, and dairy DEAs. And Barry is going to take this item. Thanks, Chair. Members, the purpose of this is to seek your approval for the action plan received for the spare and DEA in relation to the Food and Essential Items Transition Fund and to seek your approval for the action plan received from the Derg DEA in relation to an underspend of 3,900 carried over from the 2021 Transition Fund. Members, you'll recall, DFC allocated Council £165,792.59 in March 21, and that allocation was carried over into reserves to allow spend beyond that. Each DA was allocated £16,138. So um, each of the three rural DAs have been allocated that amount. So members, in terms of recommendation, that for spurring, a letter of offer of 16138 to the lead group Glenelly Development Trust Limited, and that members approve the outline proposal for the Derg DA, including the issue of a letter of offer of 3,900 to the lead group Derg Valley Care. Okay. Any members looking to come in on this issue? Yep. Councillor Boyle, go ahead. Just briefly, I mean, we, we welcomed this at the time, and, and I want to say kudos to DFC for. For the allocation of this funding and also to the groups involved um for the the, the projects that they put <clears throat> excuse me that they put forward and it's always good to see rural groups availing of any uh form of funding and i do know particularly in the glen Alley development and learmount community development group um the, the the work that's ongoing and has been ongoing throughout COVID there and just to compliment them on the work they have been doing um, uh, in that regard and indeed the DERG area. So well done to both um, organisations um, for the work that has been ongoing 
and it'll continue to develop. Um, it was, as I say, we welcomed it at the time, but just kudos to DFC for, for providing that funding. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, or Councillor Boyle. Um, I see Alderman Devenny's proposed item in the chat box. There's no further speakers. Someone seconded it. Councillor Boyle seconded it. And I gave members some sense of no discontent on this item. Um, so we'll take that as passed. Members, moving on to item 11, it's the consensual grant making model 2022-23 action plan for the Fawn, Spearn, Strabant Town, Foylside and Moor DEAs and Barry is going to take this item. Members, your approval sought on the consensual grant making action plan for 22-23 received for Fawn, Spearn, Strabant Town, Foylside DEA and the Moor DEA and to seek your approval on the grant making action plan 21-22 received for Foylside DEA and that's in your Appendix D members, and that's for the previous financial year. Members, you'll note that two action plans have been received from Foilside um, for the financial year 22-23, as well as the 21-22 financial year. The allocation of 15,000 for Foilside was not spent last financial year. As a result, the underspend of 15 for the 21-22 period was carried into this financial year to allow them to submit a proposal. So, members, just in terms of the finance, there's no additional financial implication to Council. The allocation of the 120,000 and 15,000 per DA is included within the rates for 22-23 financial year. The additional 3,000 allocated to the fund DA has been carried over from the 21-22 DA allocation. And the allocation of the 15 for Foilside 21-22 has been carried over again into this year's financial budget. So, members, in terms of the recommendations that you approve and endorse the action plans submitted for Fawhan, Spurran, Stravan Town, Foilside um, for 22-23, uh, Foilside for the financial year 21-22, and finally that members endorse the action plan submitted by Moore for 22-23 financial year with a letter of offer of £15,000 to all of the DAS members. Thank you. All right. Okay, so beginning your declaration of interest is noted and you want to come in on the item? Gormaga Chair, um, just on behalf of Sinn Féin, I would like to propose the recommendations within the report. Um, I think these applications um, for the fund is again representative of the community and voluntary sector stepping up. They support our communities, the vast majority are going to be um, warm hubs to support people within our community during a cost of living crisis, which we're all too aware of. Um, so. I would like to just, as I say, propose it on behalf of Sinn Féin, um, and I look forward to seeing it rolled out um, and supporting our community organisations wherever we can. For my own. Thank you, Councillor McGinley. I have no other indicated speakers. Um, it's been I seconded, proposed. Chair, the recommendation. Seconded by Alderman Devaney. And I'm sensing no dis discontent on this item. We'll take it as passed. It's item 11. Members, item 12 to 15 um, is open for information. If you want to raise any issues on it, Councillor Fire. Yeah, item 15 was about the swimming lessons, et cetera, that we provide across you know, the three pools um, in our council area. First of all, it is the number of kids that have learned to swim in our facilities over the last year is super. And Barry, I noticed at the last meeting, you told us there were capacity issues uh, within the team that would teach kids to swim and adults. Um, are we any further forward in getting those resolved yet so that swimming lessons can return to the normal levels? Through yourself, Chair. Yeah, um, Councillor Farrell, we actually, as recently as this week, um, we had a couple of meetings before that, Karen and myself and members of the team have, have, meant, have met, and we're, we're looking at a, a swim structure in terms of recruitment of our swim teachers. So we're very hopeful. Now we have to present options to the trade union, but we don't anticipate any difficulties. So we've better work to go through, but we believe we have the right structure in place to recruit um, and look at job descriptions and actually grow our program. So I know we've had a couple of minor issues where we've had to cancel lessons because of a lack of availability of instructors, but we hope with this 
um, new structure in place and over a period of time we'll actually be able to grow the business and, and have more lessons because as members will be well aware we have a huge waiting list for all our, our, our swimming programs so yeah we're hopeful following this week's discussions that we can move forward it will take a wee bit of time but we you will see the program grow over, over certainly the next nine to twelve months Chris very happy that yep happy enough Chris or Minnie, is this a, a same issue or another issue you're looking to come in on Item 14 shares, my issue. Thank you. Okay, we'll take item 13 first, and that's Councillor Ferguson. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the officers for um, bringing the report. I know it was very short notice for them, and I requested it at the last um, health and communities after the tragedy that we had here in uh, Enoch Glock. And it is good to see that in such a short period of time, you know, in some of these numbers, we're talking April to June, you know, a couple of months, we have 2000 people um, accessing our school, sorry, 2000 children. And I know Barry has alluded to the fact that we are hoping to recruit and have more access to our swimming lessons because they are highly sought after. I'm just wondering, Barry, uh, you said there's a huge waiting list. And I know it's something that I hear all the time from parents, that uh, the biggest niggle that they have is the structure in which you have to access courses for children through the likes of Foil Arena. So say, for example, um, I was booking the kids onto rock climbing this weekend. I can only ring from 6 a.m. on Wednesday morning and there isn't an online capacity. If things were sorted out, if we had enough capacity for all the swimming lessons, would there be availability to do an online booking system? Because I know parents can be quite busy day to day and then they add in that added stress as if you don't ring first thing, you may miss out. And, and we see that every summer um, and whenever the swimming lessons come up that there are parents going, you know, I tried ringing a hundred and odd times. Um, so, but again, I really appreciate the, the report, it, it does highlight how much our swimming lessons are being used. And not only that, it, it has shown me the different levels of swimming lessons that we have and the fact that we do have that national pool lifeguard qualification as well as, you know, further programs. So um, thanks again to the officers for bringing this report. I, I think once we get the capacity, there is a, a lot of improvement that we could do to make it more accessible to families to, to book, if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah, through yourself, Chair. Um, look, we 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 are currently, and we will continue to review that process, not just for swimming lessons, but right across all our programs, Councillor Ferguson. But at present, it is particularly difficult because we can only run a certain number of blocks. But based on the last question I answered, uh, Councillor Far, the more the more swimming blocks that we can put on, we would hope that parents um, and guardians would have less issues actually booking on but at present it is difficult online because just simply because we have a huge waiting list in terms of that and the best way is coming into the centre and actually ringing at present but we are reviewing that and, and appreciate the frustration of parents um, so it is something we keep under regular review and we, we look at as as we go forward with the, with the new swimming structure. Thank you. Bye. Um, the next speaker on item 13 is Councillor McGinley. Thank you, my good chair. And it's slightly um, off. Thank you, Barry, for the report. And I think, as has been previously alluded to, that you know, it is fantastic to see that there is an uptick and a big uptick in terms of the swimming provision. I think what it highlights for me, and I, I feel like I bring this up in nearly every meeting, is the need for the reopening and the work to be completed at William Street Baths. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing massive demand here. Um, the more that that demand or the, the, the provision is increased to meet that demand, the less public swimming we have in other, other swimming pools across the district. So I just wanted to reinforce and bring up and raise the, the issue that the closure and the ongoing situation with the William Street Baths um, is probably stifling the, the amount more, the number of people that we can be bringing on to these, these swimming programs. So I just wanted to raise that um, in, in line with this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bailey. We do have an item 20 in confidential that um, is an update on the, the city bus. The next um, speaker on item 13 is Alderman Guy. Thank you, Chair. And I just want to touch on um, the recent paper brought before us about City of Derry Swimming Club and that they were looking for uh, more access to uh, swimming hours, obviously, with the, the William Street bus still closed. And I know they do, they put a lot on the training and teaching uh, new swimmers, 
of all ages. Is there possibly um, an avenue there we could look at where they would take over some of the training in exchange for um, extra training hours that they are looking for? And the fact that we're trying to cut down on our budget um, right across council services, would it be would this be something that could be looked at and maybe we could benefit from to save a bit of money? Thanks, Chair. Uh, through yourself, Chair. Um, yeah, in terms of the previous papers around City Dairy Swimming Club, as members of the were, they run their squad programs, which we are able to facilitate. And City Dairy run their own swimming lesson program. It's a version of the Learn to Swim program, but um, all options are are open to to council. But if we were to give up our own swimming lessons, that would actually have a negative impact on rates. It's one of our biggest income generators within council. We have a huge demand. So if we were to outsource that in any way, you would actually see the rates increase at, e at each of the centres because it's probably, our, along with our gym memberships, our biggest earner um, in, in each of our in our tier one sites. Alderman McGay, happy, happy response? Yeah, I just thought there was maybe something else that could be looked at, some agreement that I would need to sit down and look at things, but numbers-wise and so on, and I know what Barry's saying, but is there is there no other way that they could actually take on that and exchange while whilst we would well maybe whilst we would have some sort of uh payment uh received they would in turn uh get extra sessions i don't, I don't know i wouldn't need to sit down and look at facts and figures like but um it's just a thought i was just discussing with someone i thought it maybe it might be an idea Just through yourself, Chair. The just just for information, as I say, City of Derry deliver um their squad programs, which is for the competitive swimmers, but they deliver their own lesson program, which is an income generator for their own club. Um, and our our swimming lessons are an income generator for council. So, if we were to to give over our prime slots, there would would be a definite loss in income for the council. It wouldn't be it would wouldn't be a favourable outcome compared to what we are now. We have staff employed both part-time and full-time, to deliver our, our school swimming and our lesson programme. And we, we plan to grow that staff complement the next number of months in order to, to grow our programme from three blocks to four blocks a year. That's great, Barry. Thanks. Thank you, Alderman Gay. Um, the next speaker is Councillor Tierney. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> thanks to Barry for the report and his responses um, this far. Um, in relation to the suggestion that we ask City Dairy to, to take over um, our biggest income generator. It's not something that we would be um, supportive of. Um, and I appreciate the councillor guys or Alderman guys saying that there's um, work to do around that, but um, I, I, I don't see why, why we would do it. Um, my concern is around particularly where this paper came from. It came out of the back of a number of reports um, that we've had around City Baths and around um, provision uh, within our pools um, around City of Derry Swimming Club as well. Um, but if we're planning to grow the current um, swimming lessons and swimming program uh, that we offer within all of our pools, um, will that have an impact on the Lake of City of Derry? Uh, because we already know um, that, you know, timetables within the pools um, are, are limited um, and they're bursting at the seams at the moment. Um, so if you're planning to grow that, in advance of city baths opening, will that have a negative impact on user groups in the other um, pools? And I think Councillor McGinley um, is right. I think it points out the need um, to get city baths opened um, as quickly as possible, um, providing um, everything with a report later on this evening goes um, according to plan. But I think it points out the need um, that is there. But I would just be slightly concerned around us growing um, the potential swim lessons that we provide and the negative impact that that might have for um, other user groups. And I know Councillor Ferguson um, pointed out that getting that they booked on the swimming um, lesson uh, within our pools is nearly as hard as getting a doctor's appointment. Um, but if it's growing that much, will it have a negative impact? Because if it has a negative impact um, on the ground and in the pool, 
it's going to end up back in this chamber and we're going to be back to square one again if we don't progress with city baths. Thank you. Through yourself, Chair, the, the growing of the swimming programme will be around our three tier one sites, Templemore, Foil Arena and Riverdale. And look, there there is there will be capacity. It won't it won't negatively impact user groups such as City of Derry. Those are block bookings and you know, we will honour those. It will be in our least busy times. It it may have a small impact on our public swimming, but what we endeavour to do, for example, is um if Foil Arena are delivering swimming lessons, we make sure that Templemore is open for public swimming and vice versa. So we will continue with that model and we'll also be looking at other hours in the like of uh, Riversdale, you know, during the day and, and off peak times as well. So it won't have a, an overly negative impact, but there will be some small disruption in order to get another block in. But uh, the block bookers, those those bookings will be honoured as well. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for that, Barry. And see when you were delivering the report at the beginning, um, you pointed out that there was high demand um, for our swimming lessons and I think everybody accepts that um, and I understand that there's a waiting list to get on um, our Learn to Swim programme right now at the minute. How big is that waiting list? Do you know? Through yourself Chair, um, I don't have the exact figure but it's in hundreds. Um, you know if there's if there's 800 can can be on a swimming block, there's maybe a four or 500. You know, that may be an exact figure, but that's the sort of percentage you're talking about. There's there's huge demand and interest in it, yeah. There's 400 kids across our district looking to get on their swimming programme and we can't facilitate them. Through yourself, Chair, what we normally do is we be able to get them on the next block. They don't be sitting indefinitely, but they just mightn't get on that block. So they would get on the next block and the next term time in school. So if we go from three blocks to four, we have a much better opportunity then to, to facilitate them as soon as possible. There'll still be no guarantee for everyone, you know, back to Councillor Ferguson's point, you know, it's, a, it's how quick he can get in, but definitely four blocks will ease that uh, and pressure on Council. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Um, Councillor Doyle, I think I missed you out there. You wanted to come in under item 12? Yeah, no worries, Chair. Um, I'm stressing it a wee bit, but um, the uh, the report re refers a lot to getting out and being active. Um, and myself, a number of MLAs and a number of council colleagues were down as part of World Site Day today, down at, uh, with RNIB. Um, and we undertook a fantastic exercise walking through the city centre with AIDS um, and uh, with blindfolds on us um, and other um, apparatus that demonstrated to us um, how difficult sometimes it is to navigate the city centre uh, and I'm sure other places uh, when you have um, when you are blind or visually impaired and I would just like to ask um, if we could have our NIB uh, come and speak to us uh, about this and they also undertake a training programme uh, which is two hours long uh, that they told us about today um, and to get some information from that about uh, to maybe offer to members because I have to say it was uh, genuinely a very it was an absolutely fantastic uh, exercise and if we're really passionate about getting people out and being active we have to address what all of the issues that I certainly learned of today and I know others did as well um, so it might be personal a wee bit uh, with that uh, chair I accept that but I um, thought it was really important to get that on thank you Just for clarity, Councillor Doyle, so you're inviting the RNIB to present at the committee and also for Council to deliver to your training programme? Yeah, RNIB. RNIB. So, which which R RNIB provide the programme, but it would be very good for members if we had an opportunity to, to do that. Yeah. Um, Councillor Doyle, I, I'm not too sure if there's a financial cost or anything that I'm happy to take your first point in terms of bringing our, our NAB to um, the committee, to present to the committee. But would you be happy if officers come back to you on the second point in terms of the training programme to see if they can... Yeah, I'm actually... Councillor Boyle, go ahead. Yeah, um, um, just to um, come in there, Chair, just on the back of uh, Councillor Doyle. Um, uh, I also today, this morning, was, was on the same walk. We had the Zim specs on and, and, and the blindfolds. Um, and the RNIB do facilitate that uh, walk around, you know, with people with sight loss and visually impaired 
um, problems. And I, I mean, I did make the point um, that, you know, this council, uh, we, we have a good um, working relationship with RNIB and in and, 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 and terms of policy making and uh, that, uh, around our street furniture and all of that there, you know, um, we also work well with the user groups. Um, but um, maybe, I mean, uh, there was a lot of elected reps there today and it might be um, beneficial maybe to some of the corporate staff maybe to avail of that training, um, you know, that work in this sector, health and communities, if they so wish, because it is, you know, it's important that everybody has an opportunity to experience what it's like, um, you know, to be in the shoes of someone with a sight loss or visually impaired, to see the difficulties they face and the hazards that they face on a daily basis around our towns and city centres. So, you know, might be no, if, if, if the corporate staff were happy enough to undertake that. I mean, it, it doesn't last any more than 30 minutes. So maybe some days in their lunch break, they, they could avail of that. That's what. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Boyle, and uh, Asif is going to take that on and hopefully pursue it. Um, and thank you, Councillor Doyle, for that as well. And there will be or NAB will be invited to to present at the committee. Um, the next um, item number I think is fourteen. Councillor Mooney, you're the next speaker. Yes. Chair, thank you for allowing me on. Um, this is. This item comes off the back of last month's meeting and I raised the chair's business. I think Barry is prepared to report and I have read the, I have read the report and I acknowledge the content of it and I do acknowledge the, the work already done at uh, outlined at section 3.1 and 3.4. I just visited the track today uh, before, before this committee started and uh, I do see some slight improvement on it but um, I'm, I would like to welcome 3.5 and, uh, and the allocation of funds for 8,500. Uh, in relation to the improvement works uh, that are going going to be starting on the, the track, uh, on the track surface and uh, to improve the track surface. But uh, one point that was raised there at, at the end of that uh, paragraph was um, I would like to, I, I was wondering if Barry could outline when um, those works will be starting because obviously uh, it's not identified there. But furthermore, Chair, just really on the next paragraph of 3.6, I think Barry and others have identified that obviously this won't resolve the, the long running drainage problems that affect the track. Uh, and for those who use it uh, frequently, will know where they are and where the locations are on the track. But my memory from last month was I think I raised, and I think maybe even Councillor Jackson may have raised as well, uh, if, my, if my memory shares me right. Um, I think I requested that there might have been a previous costing that, that's on Council's. Um, the council have already about maybe uh, costing on the basis of a of a new facility down there. Um, I thought that would be included in this paper, but it doesn't seem to be. And I was wondering would Barry have an update on that, and if there was any further updates in relation to what potential costings would be uh, if this was identified as a, as a as a capital project going forward. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, through yourself, Chair. Um, Councillor Mooney, in answer to your first question, the time scales, um, members will be aware there is a Christmas event, a trail. I'm not, I'm not sure of the right name for it, plan for St. Columns Park. So that will run throughout the month of, of December and it'll take our property team um, a number of weeks for procurement. So we're looking, as of a meeting yesterday, at early January to carry out these works, the 8,500 works, Councillor Mooney. We could have got in earlier. In December, but it was felt with with this trail and everything, the disruption to that, and and maybe any any I don't know it would cause damage, but it's more sensible to plan these for January. So that's when we're planning for those works. Um, with regards to a long term solution, uh, to to the issue, um, I spoke to our colleagues in property. They they don't have the expertise, and they sent us on to our capital section. Um. They couldn't find any any cost on it, but they said this is a new capital project, and they wouldn't be in a position to give us rough costs. Even that, a design team would need to to look at this. There'd need to be surveys undertaken. There'd need to be boreholes and things dug, and it would a proper engineered project. So, 
some of the team did say it would be somewhere in the region of three to four hundred thousand pounds, but that's really a shot in the dark at the minute without a proper design and a proper, you know, capital resource allocated to this. So it's it's probably too early to say what the cost would be, but it is definitely a major capital project and uh it's like developing a track from, from scratch, essentially, when you're putting new drainage in and a new base layer and all of the rest. So um, unless that we had that resource, we wouldn't be in a position to, to present th those figures. Thank you, Barry. Councilor Mary, can, can, can I just welcome that? that uh, yeah, go ahead. Acknowledge, acknowledge Barry's uh, um, explanation there. I, I do agree that if there's, if there's going to be an event on in December, then um, we should probably hold off the works till January. That would be common sense. You wouldn't want to be doing work now and then a, an event like that in December where the footfall would probably be, will actually maybe just um, wreck the actual work that's been done. But uh, perhaps I can take it up a Barry later on, maybe uh, the actual um, idea of going forward as a, as a, as a long-term solution. Um, if we don't have the figures there, then there's no point really to try and discuss it today. But thank you, Chair. Thank you, Barry, for the update. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Minnie. Um, next speaker, Councillor Jackson. Yes. Um... Thanks, Chair, and thanks to Councillor Munich, because I think he, he asked a lot of the questions that I, w I was I had myself. But um, I suppose, uh, in terms of Councillor Munich's final point in relation to it making sense, they they postpone the planned works until January, until after the trail. What what that does is it just highlights the fact that um, that these short term solutions aren't addressing the problem and um if if we're going to spend eight and a half thousand pound to to rectify um damage that's done um they and, and i know it's contained within the report around um some of the work that that has been carried out and the additional stone that's been put on the shield track and but if if a if a trail a christmas trail it's going to cause that sort of damage if um if whenever we're we're carrying out remediation works and then normal usage of the track or um or any small scale events at the track um undoes the the work that we've carried out then what it does is highlight the case for a long-term solution um and i like councillor money would look forward to seeing that um be drawn up um costed and and brought forward the the capital working group there's uh, because I, because i think us spending um repairs money they continuously address the problem is it isn't cost effective in the long run so the, the the most cost effective measure is is they install the adequate drainage and resurfacing the the running track. They they make it fit for purpose. All right, and I, I, I appreciate you mightn't have answered, but I, um, I did recall hearing um, that there was some suggestion that there could have been some works that could be carried out to address the problem as part of the Corn Village. Um, project and uh, is there, uh, and, and I, I appreciate that that's that that, that that that's in a much closer time scale. So, is there is there any hope in relation to that 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 could alleviate some of the problems? Through yourself, Chair. No, the the link to this project through the Acorn Villages. There's new change. There's funding for new changing rooms to service the track and to service the pitch down there. So, as I highlighted at the last report, the members even even if we develop the long term solution to to this site, you know, in terms of the substantial capital works, if we continue to hold events, which is a very popular event space, there's also no guarantee that the track won't flood and the pits won't be damaged and we won't continually have to spend money repairing it after every large scale event. Um, we've had a couple of large scale events. The, the weather wasn't great with one of them. It didn't it didn't uh, cause a lot of damage to the pitch, um, but we have had the, the heavy flooding and the track has been negatively impacted. So there will be no guarantee even with the long term um, project well, if that'll solve the problem. So. While we're carrying out these works and scoping out the long-term issue, it is something we're going to have to grapple with. You know, we're getting new chains and facilities. We have a good pitch. 
as a good running track, you know, is it a sports facility? Can we use it? Or do we do we make the call that, yeah, after every large scale event, we do ask promoters to protect, put protective um, material down in order that we don't have to go in and, and fix that after every event. Councillor Jacks, are you happy? Do you want to come back in? You okay? Councillor Tierney? Thank you, um, Chair. Um, I think Barry's final few remarks here um, have pointed out the massive need um, that we need to, to look at more urgently, uh, I think, than what, than what we expect. Because, and I appreciate why you're waiting there after the, the trail event takes place. Absolutely, makes complete sense. But this work will begin hopefully in January. Um, I have no idea how long it'll take, but it'll not be, be too long before you're back in the concert season again. Um, 3.7 of the report points out that officers are working with the event section um, around, and, and the executive officer around an open call starting, I think it said November, did it, on that report? I, opening in early, early November. So before you even get this work started, you could have a number of concerts, events booked under that particular space, potentially taking place not too long after we've just spent eight and a half grand carrying out that work. I think it shows that there's a massive issue in terms of event space within uh, the city in particular, but within the, the wider council district. Everything is there, but I understand from speaking to um, promoters that you can only have five events per year in Everton. For what reason? I do not know because it makes absolutely no sense um, in my mind. Um, but if after every event we're going to have to spend eight and a half grand or there or thereabouts, this is with the greatest respect a stick and plaster um, that, we're, that we're actually doing. And I appreciate all of the, 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 the work and the conversations that you've had around um, the capital build and how we do that but this to me feels like we are going down a route um, right now with our eyes wide open at throwing good money after bad um, if we don't have a conversation in advance of this open call op opening in November around what promoters have to do to protect the track um, ahead of that um, so I think that's something that we that we really need to look at and it needs to be included in any application process that's opening in November. Um, and I don't know what the solution is, um, but I think it would be unfair to ask people or they put out an open call to have potential events in that space. People applying on date, getting their date, booking it, making their plans, and then realizing that three or four months down the line, Council have lumped on an extra cost to try and protect the track. I think that needs to be included now before that open call goes out. And have you any suggestions of what that might be or what it might look like? Because for promoters, it will be a big, it will be a big drawback. And we don't have great usage of Everton. Um, five events a year, as I understand, two of them are uh, amusements. The Holland's that amusement thing at, at, at Christmas. Two of them are, are, are taken up with that. So you've got three events and a big space, which has got a perfect floor. Um, great access, not 100 yard, 500 yards away from, from where we're talking about. Why would we not be, instead of entering on the discussions with the events section and the executive office, why would we not be lobbying the executive office? They left the blockage of five events in that space and allow that to become a hub of musical events and outdoor event space across the city, because it, or across the area, because it's madness not to do that. Thank you. Through yourself, Chair, I'll go back, I'll answer them in reverse, if that's okay. Um, the last one, in terms of, I'm not sure, our, our colleagues in the events team, in terms of what their discussions are, but we can find that out with, with Ebrington. We, we do try to facilitate them, and even last year, last year's bookings, 
they had contacted us and they managed that booking process on the promoter's behalf. And even last year, we had an indemnity in. So uh, if you wanted the books and Collins Park pitch and running track, you had to provide that indemnity. And if there was damage done to the pitch and or track, then you would be liable for that. Um, and a couple of the promoters did pay a small amount at the time our property team went in and assessed what, what the damage was, but we didn't realise the complexity around the drains being blocked and the, the rainwater and that coming down from Browning Drive. So as part of this process this year, um, we're being very specific in terms of the events and the type of events that we can facilitate at St Collins Park and what a promoter has to put in place, be it protective material or I you know they have to pay for the clean up or whatever afterwards. So it is a it is a balancing act. We we within health and community are trying to provide sporting facilities and we're trying to facilitate our partners in business and culture to run large scale events. And the two are difficult. You know, if you're putting a lot of people on that pitch and the weather's not great, the water has to go somewhere. It doesn't all go into the drain straight away. And where's the easiest place for it to go? On the running track, which which uh, borders the pitch. So it is very, very difficult. And and that is something that we're looking at and we will bring further reports back in into this committee. We don't believe that the trail one will cause any real damage. We just didn't want to disrupt that around December and we don't believe there'll be any works required and we do the new works early in the new year. But it is something we're grappling with to try and get that balance. And, you know, Ebrington is still at the minute permitted five events. So we don't want to be seen as turning down large scale events for the city. Um, but at the same time, we know the very real implications and the damage to runners, people that walk down there and, and, and the footballers about the pitch. So it's something we bring further reports into this committee on in terms of where we're at so that members can have an idea of what we have facilitated or are going to facilitate for next year in terms of events and any likely implications on the sporting infrastructure. I think I answered all the questions there, Brian, but I'm not sure. I think you did and you highlighted something um, which... Um, I think it's it's key to, to all of this. Um, when you said we don't want to be seen to be turning down um, events for the, for the city, but the executive office do, and that's exactly what they're doing with five events um, in that space, and it's an absolute disgrace that they're that they're doing it. Thank you, Councillor Tierney. Um, members, item fifteen corresponds. First speaker, Councillor Hargan. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, look, this is uh, this is about the top up fees that uh, care homes charge, and I think the response that we got from the department, sorry, from the Minister of Health and from the uh, Western Trust, uh, was quite disappointing. Uh, look, they they're not really taking responsibility for dealing for the with the fact that um, a lot of families are struggling right now, particularly in the cost of living crisis, with paying these top up fees, and from from reading those responses you, you get the impression that relatives are choosing uh or given there's a choice for families about um uh, what care home their loved one goes into and i look we regularly hear from from uh constituents that there isn't really any choice that it's that it's the um the trust that picks the care home or the nursing home um and as you can see there 31 of the care homes in the district um, are are charging top up fees, um, and we are regularly told as well that uh, these care homes don't actually offer any additional services. Uh, and the types of services that we see um, being offered are, uh, you know, relatives have been told that uh, their loved one will get their newspapers and extra showers for for a, for an additional hundred and fifty pound a month. Um, and this is just, I I think that this is unacceptable. So the way that we see this, and I think the way that many others see it, is that that what's happening here is that this is a process being used by private care homes to make more profit, um, and that we have absolutely no oversight of it, and there's no regulation to determine whether or not um, a care home is actually providing additional or extra services that warrant the sometimes uh, you know extremely high uh, top up fees that you can see from the report go from. Ten pound a month to uh, an additional uh, ten pound a week to one hundred and ninety pound a week, uh, and that is going to put that is putting a lot of families under strain right now. So the reason why this is important is because if if these fees uh, are unreasonable or unnecessary, they're they're, they're you know 
the families involved could be refunded um, to the tune of thousands of pounds and also um, uh, there could be a big refund to the public purse. So I, I think we have to continue to pursue this. So what I want to propose is that uh, that we ask the Western Trust um, uh, to provide us with more exact details uh, on the additional services that the 31 care homes that uh, are, are making the top of charges in our district, um, what they are, uh, so that we can actually see what the difference is between those care homes and the 20 that are not that don't have additional charges. So this is really a follow on in terms of their correspondence with us. And, and, I, and I think it's the only way we can actually only get a bit more uh, detail on it. So I, I will put that into the chat group right now, if that's all right, Chair. Yep, perfect. Councillor Herkin. Councillor Boyle, I think you were initially coming in as the same issue you wanted yes. to come in. Yep, go ahead, Councillor Boyle. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I couldn't argue with what Councillor Harkin has just said. Um, totally support that. And um, uh, if he would allow me um, also to add a, a, a bit on to that, to also ask the Trust what they are doing in terms of planning for future investment into um, trust care homes. Um, obviously, the cost of care homes and the fees are having a major impact on families. Um, more so now than ever uh, because of the cost of living crisis. There is a shortage of trust owned facilities right across the city and the district. Um, and as he said, it is allowing the private sector to step into that space and charge extortionate amount of top up fees. Um, so if, if uh, Councillor Harkin would also allow to include in his proposal to ask the Trust what are their plans for future investment into much needed Trust care home, care home facilities across the city and district also. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Harkin, are you happy to have that added? Yep, you're happy enough. Yep. Councillor Farr. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I think everybody can ag agree that care home fees in general um, are extortionate and exorbitant, um, and there needs to be real, real action from government to make them, on to make them more affordable. Um, and when we had an discussed this initially a few months ago, when, when Councillor Hargan raised it, you know, there's a law from 1972 that top of fees can't be paid by the person in the care home and has to be paid by a third party, which makes no sense at all. I don't get the rationale behind it. And when I saw that Councillor Harkin was going to speak in this item, I thought he was going to say that we asked for a report from the Western Trust. We asked for a report from the Department from Health, Department of Health. Well, we actually asked and they present to this committee and in both of those responses, they've ignored that invitation. So whilst I support um, the proposal that Councillor Harkin has, has tabled and the amendment from Councillor Boyle, I don't think this can be this. We write them a letter, we wait for a response. We write them another letter, we wait for a response. Let's get them in and hear what they have to say because that's what we asked for initially. And in fairness, both our organisations have ignored that aspect of our request. So I would prefer if they attended in person and we can put these questions to them instead of having this continuous flow of correspondence. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor, I'm going to ask you to put that in the chat box. And Councillor Boyle, would you be able to put yours just for clarification and people can see what they're going to be voting on now?
Members, I don't think any of these three proposals are um, in direct opposition to each other. So, if members are happy, we can take them together. Um, Councillor Harkin, if you're happy to take these together. Hi, hey, Chair. Yeah, look, uh, it, it's not my call. I, I think that, they're all, that this is a, a, a very good proposal that we have right now. So, I'm assuming everybody else will as well. And um, we should be asking what the plans are to expand uh, the number of uh, care homes, or sorry, trust homes that we have. Um, could council officers maybe, did, did we speak directly to representatives from the Western Trust and from the Department of Health um, about coming in? Did, did they give a response to that or did they just send in the reports? Because I, yeah, I agree. I think that they should be in here. We should be trying to hold them directly accountable um uh for what's happening i mean uh, what what's really happening is that there are uh private companies making millions while uh families are really struggling right now with these top up fees and uh, and really they don't have a voice and we know that you know the same agent the same care homes are the ones that have uh blocked trade unions coming in to give their workers a voice but we've also seen uh, them getting handed huge sums of money in recent years uh, during COVID and even now um, uh, of public money to, to help. So, uh, you know, there there is a complete lack of accountability here. There's a complete lack of oversight. There's a complete lack of regulation. And uh, this didn't just happen. Uh, this was created on purpose. And so whether it's through this correspondence or getting them in here, uh, but we need to, uh, this this we need to try and push on this because um, those who are uh, paying these fees right now are looking for help. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, just to confirm that um, post the committee decision, we issue um, letters um, to the relevant bodies uh, specifically detailing the content um, of the resolved motion. Um, so the, the trust will have its sight of the request in terms of the invitation, um, plus also the, the supporting correspondence. Um, so there hasn't been any specific individual conversations um, with um, either body at this point. Okay, thank you, Karen. Members, to deal with this proposal in front of us, I'm going to take it as proposed by Councillor Hargett, a uh, seconder. Or propose it, Councillor Boyle. Members, I think we're all in agreement and there's a good bit of teamwork getting this together. So I'm um, happy to take this as past members. Members, that concludes item, I think, 15, which is corresponds. I'm going to take a five minute comfort break um, before we move into confidential. Um, yeah, so we're back at 25 past six. Thanks, members.
Yeah. Okay, members, apologies took a few minutes, more than five minutes there. Uh, members, um, can I get a proposal and seconder going to confidential, please? Proposal, Roy Fire, seconder, Councillor Boyd. And we'll just wait a moment. 